Good evening. This is Quintus Curtius, and this is the third of our lecture series, which I'm conducting on my book, Stoic Paradoxes, which is a translation of Cicero's book by the same name. And in this podcast, we will discuss the fundamentals of Stoic doctrine. In the first two podcasts, we discussed, in the first podcast, actually, the life of Cicero, And in the second podcast, we discussed what were the fundamentals or foundations of Cicero's thought. Now what we're going to do is discuss the fundamentals of Stoic doctrine. What were the guiding principles? What were the main underlying tenets of this most influential and interesting of the ancient philosophical schools? You can find my book, Stoic Paradoxes, on my website. If you look under the tab, Books, and just click on Stoic Paradoxes, it can also be found on Amazon by searching under my name, Quintus Curtius, or under Stoic Paradoxes. And this podcast is brought to you tonight by Fortress of the Mind Publications. Now, we know Stoicism today chiefly as a moral doctrine. Everyone knows or claims to know that Stoicism provided a comprehensive and compelling moral structure. But what is less known today is that it also had an advanced cosmology and a formal dialectical architecture. Unfortunately, we're hampered by the fact that most of the original Stoic books and treatises that existed in the ancient world did not survive uh, late antiquity or the Middle Ages. Most of the great voluminous writers on the subject on on this subject uh, did not survive that period of time, so we're forced to try to infer these doctrines from fragments and from quotations by other authors. But we generally have a good idea of what's out there. The universe, according to the Stoics, was controlled and guided by a divine mind, or a god. Only matter exists, and that should be the focus of human concern. This This uh, divine mind, as they called it, can be seen as a form of matter, and it creates the universe as we know it. And all movement and all life in the universe proceeds from this fact. And in this respect, the Stoics took their cues from the philosopher Heraclitus, who lived from 535 to 475 BC, who was very influential. We know him and his works chiefly from fragments that have survived. But the Stoics imagined, following in his footsteps, a fiery spirit that was behind the divine mind and imbued the universe with its breath. This fiery breath was what gave rise to the so-called four elements, according to Heraclitus, earth, air, fire, and water. And to him, God was nearly indistinguishable from this substance. We could almost imagine the universe as a vast living thing with God as its soul. And in this immutable law of the universe, the logos, the Greek word logos, was fate or fortune. And to submit to this law was the proper duty of man. This word logos, by the way, has caused no end of confusion in the study of philosophy. And I won't even attempt to define it here, but it can be best understood as being almost akin to a divine principle. It was used by many different philosophers in different ways, but for our purposes here, we can think of it as a divine principle. Now, Stokes also believed that the universe was created out of fire and one day would again be convulsed in fire to give birth to another universe. So there was an unending cycle of birth and death, and this cycle was the actual fate of the universe, and this was inescapable. The soul of man was just like the soul of the universe. It is like a fiery breath. It resides in the body, animates it, but it is not strictly immortal. It too will perish in the great firestorm that will one day consume everything. So because of this reality, as the Stoics saw it, the only logical position for the rational man was to submit his will to the divine workings of fate. And this was what the Stoics called a wise man. They used the term in a little bit different 
form than what we think of as wise. Wisdom to the Stoics was submitting one's will to the divine workings of fate, being able to accept the inevitable, being able to accept this endless cycle of birth, creation, and destruction. The wise man would seek to live in accordance with nature. He would not try to fight this. Free will does exist, but it is not something that can be resisted too much because the natural order of things was simply this reality, and to try to resist that would be setting oneself up for a life of frustration and misery. So in, in some ways we can say that there was a oriental fatalism to Stoicism. They were as fatalistic as the Epicureans, but they were repelled by the Epicurean suggestion that pleasure should be the goal of the wise man. If we remember, the um, Epicureans believed that pleasure should be the wise man's goal. Now that was something that the Stoics simply would not accept, and that was something they denounced at every opportunity they had. The basic impulse of every organism, you know, as the Stoics continued, was the sense of self-preservation. And so the wisest course of action would be to do that which was in harmony with fate. So in place of pleasure, which the Epicureans elevated to a divine principle, the Stoics elevated virtue as the cardinal principle of their philosophy. And they believed that only a life lived in accordance with virtuous principles would save a man from unhappiness. Virtue alone was sufficient for a happy life, and the wise man would be proudly indifferent to sensual pleasures. Now, since virtue was the highest good, it followed, they believed, that vice was the greatest evil. And pleasures could be found here and there, but it was useless to chase after them. To construct one's life around the pursuit of pleasure was, according to the Stoics, the ultimate folly. Now, of course, the Stoic teachers understood that it was never easy to be a wise man. They made no bones about this. Virtue was not something that you could be wishy-washy about. Either one was virtuous or one was not. And this is something where the Stoic conception of virtue departs differently from the modern conception of virtue. Virtue to them was not seen as an upward process of moral development. Rather, it was seen as an absolute state. If a man possessed virtue, he remained virtuous regardless of his circumstances. If he lacked virtue, then his efforts at moral development would be useless. A man who was foolish or irrational was automatically wicked, according to the Stoics. And this is something we'll see in Cicero's treatise, Stoic Paradoxes, as, as we discuss each individual paradox in the lectures that will follow in this series. So a person could not be half virtuous any more than a thing could be half true or half false. And bad actions or moral transgressions and good actions were equal in the sense that they were on opposite sides of the scale and balanced each other out. A man could attain virtue by a rigorous program of self-control, of discipline, and mastery of one's emotions. And the holy grail at the end of all of this, polishing and perfection, was the achievement of the state of virtue. If a man could do this, he could become something of a demigod. Nothing would hurt him, no misfortune could ruin him, and he would never be in want for anything. So these are the fundamental tenets of Stoic philosophy. The school was founded by Zeno of Citium, who lived from 334 to roughly 262 BC, and he seems to have been influenced by the uh, a school of philosophers called the Cynics, which preceded him, especially Antisthenes, and um, after Zeno, his successors, uh, Cleanthes and Chrysippus, molded the Stoic school's uh, foundational doctrines. So it's, it's, a, it's a pity, as I said before, that none of these books have survived the passage of time. But we do know 
the fundamentals based on quotations and the treatment of these original thinkers by authors that followed. We especially regret the loss of the voluminous writings of Posidonius. He apparently wrote a great deal on this subject, and Cicero studied under him, and he's left us only uh, some scattered fragments of a massive literary output. And of the later Stoics, Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, enough has survived in these men's writings to give us an idea of what their predecessors believed in. Now, what is important is that the school, as time went on, eventually softened some of the harshness of its doctrines. As we said earlier, the, Sto the classical Stoicism was that there was no degrees of good or bad. One was either good or bad, and no attempt to modify that could really change things. You had to be uh, completely virtuous, or, uh, or if you possessed any sort of evil in you, then you were just completely uh, corrupted by that. Over time, though, these doctrines began to be modified, making them somewhat less rigid and formalistic. And in time, Stoicism would evolve into essentially a religion. And this is, this is something that's very important to remember with a lot of the, the classical schools of philosophy, is that these were more than just philosophical schools. These were uh, essentially competing religions, especially before the advent of Christianity. Stoicism was extremely popular in its day. And before Christianity came on the scene in the first centuries of uh, the Christian era, uh, Stoicism claimed as adherents some of the most powerful and influential men of antiquity. There were uh, statesmen, emperors, literary figures, uh, religious figures who all paid it homage. So it was a very influential and uh, important school because I think the adherents recognized that this was a sincere effort to come to grips with the moral problems of the world. Now, time for some criticism. What should we make of this austere and grand philosophy? I mean, is it is it is it really as accurate as we think it is? Is it a system of thought that that provides value and use for us today? Well, yes, it does. In short, it does seem to share some superficial similarities with Buddhism, at least to me anyway, with its advocacy of a universe of endless cycles and its emphasis on moral conduct as a means of liberation from earthly pain and doubt. And this raises the really interesting question of whether in ancient times Buddhist missionaries ever reached the Mediterranean era and maybe they did have an influence on this school of thought and its development. Uh, but we just don't know. In the absence of any firm evidence for or against, it's very hard to say. Personally, I think that there was a lot more cross-fertilization amongst cultures in ancient times than has generally been recognized. In, um, in my book, Pantheon, I devoted a chapter to the system of uh, philosophical, the, the philosophical school of Neoplatonism. And I noted in there that the main philosopher of this school, Plotinus, originally wanted to travel to Persia and India to study the philosophers there. So, as I see it, he would not have wanted to do that if, the, if he had not known there was something of value there. And to me, in my opinion anyway, uh, the wise men of the ancient world, the scholars of that era, were aware of what was going on in other cultures. They may, there may not have been the frequent and uh, strong ties of trade and commerce that we see today, but the word gets around. People know what the good stuff is, and people know where the good stuff is. So this is the, um, you know, the basic foundational tenets of Stoicism. And it must have, it, you know, uh, we can make our criticisms about the doctrine and say that uh, it may have been unrealistic or very difficult to follow, but it suited the character of the Roman leadership class very well. 
the old Roman ethic as propounded by moralists like Cato was a stern one. What mattered more than enjoyment were your duties, and each man had to try to accept his lot and his fate and try to find virtue within his means and abilities. And this value system is something that I, I really find attractive and admirable in Stoicism because we live in a world today where you're taught just the opposite, that every desire that you have should be fulfilled, that the world is at your beck and call, and that everyone owes you everything. And Stoicism is essentially the complete opposite of that idea. But it's not without its flaws, like any philosophical system. It seems depressingly joyless in some ways. I remember when I first read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, I was struck by just how depressing it was. But maybe I wasn't ready for it. Maybe I was too immature at the time. I really was not yet prepared to meet its majestic and dignified grandeur on an equal footing. But as I've gotten older and I've learned a little bit more about life than I used to in my 20s, I've come to appreciate a lot of the wisdom contained in Stoic writings uh, much more than I used to. And is it really true, though, that virtue alone is sufficient for a happy life? Remember, this was one of the, the main features of Stoic doctrine, that, that virtue alone is sufficient for happiness. Virtue, virtue, virtue. If we just have virtue, we can, we can do anything. And is this really true? Is, is, can a man live by virtue alone? Well, we don't know. But I think we need to look at it this way. It is better to aim high. It is better to advocate for, vir for virtue than to aim low, like the Epicureans did, which extolled pleasure and the vices of the flesh. Man needs an ethic and a moral standard and a guide that is hard for him to reach. He needs to be challenged. He wants to be challenged. And we can't make things too easy for him. And is it really true that good and bad deeds are equal in moral weight? Well, no, maybe not. But, they, but here again, look at things from a practical perspective. If we had a different rule, people would use that flexibility and leniency in that rule to take liberties with the doctrine. So it's almost better to have a principle that's difficult to reach or maybe even impossible to reach and to aim high and to make us strive to be better people than it is to take the low route and take the low ground. But it is a valid criticism that Stoicism left unchecked could slip into fatalism and resignation. And it could sap our will to get out and try to achieve things and uh, try to take an active role in our own rescue. We miss in Stoicism the, the soaring imagination of, of the Platonists or the fearless zest for life that we do find amongst the Epicureans such as Lucretius. So in my opinion, one needs to balance his philosophical studies with samplings from different schools. We can't just rely on one school. We should try to get a firm grounding and understanding of all the doctrines. And this is really what I like about Platonism and Stoicism, because they both complement each other. I like Stoicism's uh, stern, moral, uh, austere, ethical guidelines and practical advice for how to achieve discipline in one's life. And I also like Platonism for its soaring imaginative uh, value with its invocation of the immortality of the soul and its theories of beauty and truth and all of those things that we find uh, lacking in uh, Stoic doctrine. Yet, despite all this, there is a dignity and grandeur in Stoicism that somehow leaves an impression on us long after the intoxications of Platonism and Epicureanism have worn off. Now, the, as I said before, the Platonists and Neoplatonists were long on theory and, and rather short on practical moral, gu moral guidance. And in all 56 treatises of Plotinus's Aeneids, for example, we get hardly any practical advice on how to achieve this union with the one whom the author so fervently pursues.
Epicureans fare a little better. The overall impression that we get from reading Lucretius's poem, uh, De Rerum Natura, is that it is a universe of materialistic, soulless dullness, which is a, at best apathetic to the needs of man. And pleasure seems to be hardly worth a goal that a man should construct his life around. Stoicism may also have been mistaken in its idea that a man should uh, submit himself to the principles of nature. Um, we can find just as much evil as we can good in nature, and anyone who studied the natural world can, can see this. But really, what, what makes Stoicism of enduring value, and what makes us continue to go back to it over and over again, and what I think will make it always attractive to uh, young men who are trying to polish their souls and achieve uh, great things in life, it offered us a practical code for conduct. It offers us a practical code of conduct. Because in this philosophical school, we don't have any tortuous ontological problems. We have only the hard truth about the experience of living. And this is why it was no accident that Cicero was drawn more and more to Stoicism as he got older. And finally, in my view, it captured his heart in the years uh, before he approached his death. Stoicism challenges us to act against more moral relativism and weakness. It challenges us to polish our souls. It challenges us to steel our hearts against the iniquities of life and to endure that which may be unendurable. And the works of moral philosophy that it has produced from the unrivaled pens of Cicero, Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, the, these things are among the most eloquent and comforting treasures of Western philosophy. It had a profound influence on the centuries that followed. But most importantly, it challenged us to become better men. This concludes my third podcast on Cicero's Stoic Paradoxes. I hope you'll join me for the fourth lecture. This podcast was brought to you courtesy of Fortress of the Mind Publications. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.